What is going on guys? Welcome back to the channel and thank you for clicking on today's video. So today we are talking Canon EOS RP. Once again, if you guys are familiar with my channel already, you know I've put out some content talking about both the EOS RP and also the EOS R and actually the R5 here soon. I think it's actually supposed to ship tomorrow. And I've put out a couple videos specifically talking about the camera settings that I use on the EOS R and I've gotten some really good feedback on that, but I have received some questions about what camera settings I use on the RP or what things do I switch up from that video because this camera is a little bit unique. So I figured let's just do a whole video on it. So today I'm going to run you guys through the best camera settings for the EOS RP for both photo and video. And honestly, even if you don't have the RP, a lot of these settings are going to kind of carry over from one camera to the next. So maybe you'll learn something new, even if this isn't the camera that you have. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. All right guys, so let's just go ahead and jump into the camera settings here. I'm going to start out with the video side of things and then we'll jump in the photo after. So first thing you wanna do if you guys haven't yet on the little dial up here, move that around till you get to the little camcorder icon, whatever you wanna call it, the video icon, because we're starting with the video settings. So now we're going to take a look at your LCD screen down here. If you guys aren't seeing the same thing that I am, just go ahead and hit info a few times. Um, I like to just be able to see a few of the things I'm talking about. Then we're gonna hit the Q button, and then this is what we really wanna see right here. So let's start with the top left icon up here. So this is just gonna be what shooting mode you're shooting in. Um, so you have a couple different options. You have movie auto exposure, you have movie manual exposure, and then HDR movie. I always have it on the middle one, the manual exposure. I'm always shooting everything manual, especially for video. So that's just kind of what I prefer. So moving on. Next thing down here, we have our auto focus method. So this one one definitely has a few options and honestly I use some different ones depending on what I'm shooting so if I'm ever filming myself or somebody else I'm going to have the face tracking on so if I'm vlogging I want the face tracking on and then if you actually hit info it will turn on the eye detection as well so just make sure your eyes are in focus because if you're ever filming a face you want to have the eyes in focus that's what you want to have in focus now if I'm shooting anything else I'm usually on the one point autofocus that's going to look like this you just have this middle square on your LCD screen. Wherever you press, that's going to be what's in focus, or you can just hit the trash can and it throws it back to the center. But usually if I'm not in the face tracking, I'm just gonna have it on this one because I want to make sure I have a specific point in focus, whether it be for shooting B-roll, somebody walking or something like that. You know, Their face maybe isn't in the scene, but I want to be able to capture their body or their backpack, whatever it is that I'm talking about. So yeah, those are really the only two that I use. So it's either face tracking for face, everything else is usually one point autofocus. Every once in a while, I'll do this zone autofocus. If I'm shooting something like larger, I've done this before for some top downs and things like that because if I'm not really exactly looking at the screen, I wanna make sure I have whatever is in the middle in focus. So I've messed around with the zone a little bit just because it gives you a little bit larger of an area. But for most of the other times, I'm just gonna be in the one point autofocus because you know, I want something very specific in focus. So moving on, this is the important one right here. So this is going to scroll you through all the different video recording settings that you can use. Now this camera does shoot 4K, but it has a really big crop on it. So I honestly never shoot 4K. I shoot everything in 1080p, and then I'll upscale it to 4K if I'm doing something for YouTube or whatever. So there's really only two settings that I use for the movie recording, and that is either full HD 23.98 or 24 frames per second. That's what I shoot all of my projects in for YouTube, professional work, anything. I'm always working in a 24 frames per second timeline. I think it looks the most natural and that's what I would suggest for anybody else. And then the other one that I use sometimes other than the 2398 is the 59.94 or 60 frames per second full HD. And the only time I'm shooting 60 frames per second is if I'm shooting B-roll and I intend to slow that footage down by 40% in a 24 frames per second timeline to get some nice looking slow motion. So yeah, about 90% of the time I'm shooting 2398 and then the rest of the time I might be shooting the 60 frames per second if maybe I'm inserting some B-roll or whatever else and I want it to be in slow motion. And that's really it for the recording. So moving on down the line, we got the audio recording level. Some people have this on auto. I actually have it on manual myself and you just move it back right here. You'll see that little arrow at the bottom and that's where I usually have mine. I don't really like having auto levels on if your camera even offers it because sometimes it spikes and sometimes it lowers on its own. So I like to just have it on manual, usually a little bit lower and then I can kind of boost it up and post if I need to. So, you know, 
know, I'm usually recording with either the Rode Video Micro Plus or the Rode Video Micro. So depending on what mic you use or how loud you speak, obviously things are going to change a little bit for yourself, but that's usually where my kind of audio settings are most of the time. So the volume settings, I have it bumped all the way up, but honestly, this is not very important at all. This doesn't affect anything that's actually recorded. This is just, you know, if you plugged in headphones to listen to some playbacks, if you just shot an interview or something. Honestly, I just have it boosted all the way up because this does have like a tiny little internal speaker so you can hear what you just recorded out loud and it's very quiet. It's not high quality or anything. It's not intended to be, but if you boost the volume up when you play back stuff that you just shot, you can actually like hear it if you're outside or something. So that's just kind of boosted up, but that's not very important, honestly. Moving on down the road, we have the digital IS. So this is the digital image stabilization. So this just helps kind of stabilize your footage because this camera doesn't have internal stabilization. So it has this digital version, which is nice that it offers it. But usually, honestly, most of the time I'm going to have it disabled. If I ever am doing some like handheld B-roll or something like that, sometimes I'll shoot a couple shots with the normal one enabled because it will help even out some things. But every once in a while you get like some wonky looking B-roll. So I would just be careful with it and kind of watch your footage back if you're relying on one shot because I've definitely had some really weird looking b-roll with it enabled before so it's better than nothing sometimes but also if it's a very dramatic move or camera move whatever um, it can sometimes be a little wonky so just be a little careful with that and then the third option is just enhanced so it's basically the middle option just on steroids and I never mess with this because it's too much for me and also when you use either of these you can tell it crops in your image a little bit just because it crops in your edges to kind of help stabilize that so that's also another downside that it will you know crop in your image a little bit so usually I have it off you definitely just kind of mess around with it yourself see how steady your hands are and if it's gonna help you out or not so let's jump over to the next one on the other side here so for white balance some people shoot on auto which does work but sometimes you'll get some wonky colors if maybe Maybe you're like changing light a bunch and things like that. It isn't always accurate. So for myself, honestly, I just keep my white balance on daylight because I'm either shooting outside or inside my office here using natural light, or I'm using my Aperture 120D Mark II, which the D stands for daylight. So it's daylight balanced. So that will just look good right off the bat. So I never really move it off white balance. You can change that around. Um, you can always color correct in post if you need to, but it definitely just helps to get the best color that you can straight out of camera. So that's just kind of what my settings usually are. So moving on down the line here, we have the picture style. So for the Canon EOS RP, since it doesn't offer C-Log or anything like that, I usually just keep the picture profile on neutral just because it works a little bit better with my LUTs and things like that that I already have set up for the EOS R because I am used to shooting C-Log for that. So usually I just throw all my LUTs on there and really kind of lower the opacity of that and that just kind of works with my workflow but if you're not really interested in doing a bunch of color correcting or using LUTs or anything like that that's totally fine honestly if you just use the normal standard one I know that that would work pretty good for most of the time as well but if you want to kind of start dabbling a little bit into color correcting I would suggest kind of trying out neutral it's kind of like I call it the poor man's version of C-Log it's not going to give you like the dynamic range and all that stuff that C-Log would in the EOS R or higher end cameras. And if you don't know what I'm talking about with log footage or anything like that, have no fears. That might be a little bit ahead of where we're at right now. And you don't need to worry about it. So I would just shoot in the standard or in the neutral if you wanna try that out. And that's just kind of what works best for me. And then the last one here is the auto lighting optimizer. I never touch this, so I'm just going to leave that off. And one thing I almost forgot to mention for a video that I do wanna mention, if you jump into the menu, then you find this manual focus peaking settings. If you click on that, I have that on, I have the level high, and then I have the color red. All this is going to do is if you have your lens in manual focus for whatever reason, maybe you're shooting something specific and you want a visual of what's actually in focus. Let me just throw something in here so you guys can see if it's in focus or not. If you move this, it will show you exactly what is in focus by outlining it in red. So that's what that setting is. It is really useful if you wanna see what's actually in focus because if you're outside and it's bright or something, sometimes you just need to be able to see. So yeah, that 
That only works for manual focus, but it is a really nice feature to have. And honestly, pretty much everything else in this camera menu was covered in the stuff out here as well. So a lot of times you can kind of change it in the menu or out here. I think it's just a little bit easier to follow along if it's out here. Now, a couple other settings I just want to mention is usually my recording settings. Now, obviously this is going to change a bit, but I'm just going to give you guys kind of a quick rule of thumb because you know, why not? We're here. Since I'm always shooting in 24 frames per second, my shutter speed over here, one over 50 is what it's going to be at most of the time. You always want your shutter speed to be twice of what your recording frame rate is. So double 24 is really 48, but on these types of cameras, you just have to round it to the closest thing. So one over 50 is always what that's gonna be at if I'm shooting 24 frames per second, which is why an ND filter is important if you're shooting outside or anything like that. And if I'm shooting 60 frames per second, I will just bump that up to one over 125. Now the f-stop, I usually am gonna have my aperture at an f2.8, because I usually am filming on the Canon RF 15 to 35, which is an f2.8 lens. So most of the time I wanna get the most light in my camera, that shallow depth of field. If I'm ever filming something, I want it to be a little bit more in focus, I'll bump it up to the f4.0. So definitely just mess around with that a little bit and depending on what your lens has, but I usually, for the most part, want my aperture to be as shallow as it can be. And then my ISO is kind of the thing that moves around the most. So I usually try to keep this camera under 800 or 1000 ISO, just depending on what I'm shooting. And yeah, so obviously your settings are gonna change if you're filming inside or outside or depending on what you're actually shooting, but that's just kind of a quick little general what my settings usually are for filming video. Okay, so enough video, let's jump into photo settings real quick. Let's just scroll this around till we get to the M because I'm always gonna be shooting in manual for my photo settings, so we wanna have the M selected. Now, the same thing here, let's go ahead and hit our Q button. Now, some of these are gonna carry over and sound familiar, so the auto focusing method is honestly pretty much exactly the same as the video side, so the face tracking and the eye tracking, if I'm ever taking a photo you know, of a face, another person, anything with a face, I guess, you know, well, I don't know, what else has a face It's not a person? If it has a face, if it's myself, somebody else, I'm gonna have face tracking on. If it's another object, product, a logo, whatever it is, I'm usually gonna have the one point autofocus on, unless it's something that I can't, you know, if I have an overhead rig or something like that and I can't specifically see if it's in the dead center, then maybe I'll use the zone so it's a little bit bigger instead of the one point, which is pretty small. So yeah, that's pretty much it for the focusing methods. Now the next one, we have our autofocus operations. So we have our one shot or servo. Now I usually have it on one shot because I'm not shooting like action sports or anything that's like moving crazy. So one shot works best for me. If you don't know what this is, basically like, let's say you're shooting a football player. If you had it on servo, that's how you kind of like follow that person and make sure they're in focus that entire time. That would be a good example of when I would use servo mode but it does hurt your battery a little bit more and honestly, you don't always need it. So, so for myself, I'm just gonna have it on one shot because most of the time if I'm shooting photos, it's either gonna be like landscape or products or just like accessories or something on my desk. So I usually just have it on the one shot so I can just hold my camera down halfway, reframe the frame and then just snap the photo right there. So I'm not really doing any types of action sports or anything like that. So I don't personally use it on servo, but depending on what you're shooting, obviously you might need to mess around with that. Now, next thing up is the drive mode. So this is going to change quite a bit depending on what I'm shooting. Most of the time I'm just shooting things around my office or products or clothing, whatever it is. So single shooting is usually what I have it on. So that would just be, you know, if I'm trying to have just one photo. So I take a photo, it's just boom, one photo. If you're shooting action sports or things like that, that's when you would want to get into the continuous modes like high speed or anything. Maybe you're trying to get somebody walking or somebody like doing a skateboard trick, whatever. That's when you would do that because you can hear it. It's taking a bunch of photos. So that would be obviously for continuous shooting. Sometimes I'll use the self timers if I'm shooting like a self portrait or something, or I've actually used these um, if I have this camera on like an overhead rig and I'm trying to like take a photo of something and I don't want any like camera shake if I go, you know, go in here and press the button, you might get a little bit of camera movement in that. So that's something, you know, that's just an old school trick that everybody knows kind of that if you don't have like a remote trigger, you can just do the self timer. So it just kind of, you know, your hands are off of it when the photo actually goes. Now this last option, the self timer continuous actually came in clutch for me one time. I'll actually link the video above if you guys want to check it out. But I basically had to do a bunch of stuff by myself. So I was trying to like pour something onto a product and also take like continuous photos just to make sure I captured that exact moment because I only had really one take at it. So I was able to set this camera up on the tripod 
tripod, set the timer, and then in 10 seconds, it shot like a burst of photos while I was pouring the stuff. So it actually kind of saved me that I was able to have that option. So just a nice little thing to know that's there. Next thing up, the metering mode. I honestly never really changed this. I just keep this on the first option right here. And that is just kind of fine enough for me because most of the time I'm kind of checking my photos and everything like that anyways. And also you always want to be shooting in raw, which is actually our next thing. Now I always shoot my photos in raw because it's going to give you the most room to kind of mess with it in Lightroom and whatever photo editing program that you use. Raw is going to create bigger files, but it's going to allow you to do more in your edit. So it's going to help save colors and just details in the shadows and highlights and everything. Honestly, you just should be shooting raw. The only time I haven't in my life is when I've been shooting like sports and we had like a whole team of photographers and we were literally having to shoot thousands and thousands of photos between the team and we had to like sort through them quickly. So that was the only time we shot JPEGs that really I ever have in my life because we had just so many to process we had to for a quick turnaround. But honestly, I was shooting raw. It's gonna be larger files, but without a doubt, it's gonna give you the most room to edit and play with that photo and post. So definitely shoot raw. Now the next item in here is going to give you the movie recording size again, because we are in manual on this camera, you can hit record per video while you're in this mode. I don't really suggest that. I just suggest doing it in the video mode because it gives you some more options and flexibility. But I think this camera just allows you to just because it's an all manual mode, so why not? But obviously I'm talking about photos for this section, so you don't really have to worry about that too much. Anti flicker shoot, honestly, I never touched this. I wouldn't even worry about that. White balance, again, is set to the daylight like it is for video for me but that doesn't really matter too much if you're shooting photos in RAW because you can easily change that in Lightroom or whatever program you use. So I wouldn't really worry about the white balance too much. So you could just have it in auto or something. Or if you're like someone like me, you always are shooting daylight anyways, just keep it on that. Picture style, I also have it on neutral just like I did for video. Honestly, again, this doesn't really matter since you're shooting RAW, you can do whatever you want with that photo and post but I just happen to have it on neutral. That's just kind of what I'm used to and that's just what I have it on. But you could definitely have it on standard for yourself, but I just have mine on neutral. Next up here, we have our auto lighting optimizer. I keep that off. I don't mess with that at all. And then the next one up here is you have your cropping ratio. So it just kind of previews the crop. So maybe if you're shooting, let's say a YouTube thumbnail and you know it's going to be 16 by nine, instead of it being on full, which you see the entire full image here, if I go over to 16, nine, you see how it kind of like crops the top and bottom. It just gives you a preview of what a 16 by nine crop is. So that's actually super useful for me if sometimes I'm shooting an overhead photo for a thumbnail or whatever, like a flat lay, I can kind of exactly preview what my crop's going to look like just straight in camera. Then when I throw it in Lightroom, it's actually already there for me. So that's just kind of a nice little bonus. Now, just a couple of quick tips for photos. If you want to see my rule of thumb, usually for shooting photos, the same type of camera settings that I was talking about that I did for video for photo now. My shutter speed, I usually do most of my photos handheld unless it's on a tripod for you know a self-portrait or an overhead thing. So rule of thumb for shutter speed that I actually learned back in art school is I always keep it at least at one over 1 60th. That gives gives you enough to usually get rid of any camera shake of you holding the camera itself. Now, obviously, if you're shooting something that's moving or a person or a car, or whatever, you're going to have to bump that up quite a bit. But if I'm shooting just a photo of a product or something here in my office, that's usually what my shutter speed is going to be at, unless I just have too much light and then I'll crank it up a little bit more. But that's usually rule of thumb for what I'm keeping my shutter at, at least my starting point. The next thing up for aperture, again, I'm using usually my 15 to 35, which is an f2.8. So most of the time, I have it wide open to 2.8 to get some nice separation from the background and bokeh and everything like that. But specifically, if I am shooting a flat lay overhead or anything like that, and I want to make sure more things are in focus, a lot of times for photos, I'll have to bump up my aperture, you know, to like an f4.0. If maybe it's an overhead, and I want to make sure everything's in focus. But sometimes you're shooting landscapes or buildings, whatever, you know, you'll be up in like the f7s to f11, 16s, so on and so forth. But most of the time, I'm here in my office, so I just start out at 2.8. And then the ISO, this camera is actually pretty good going up pretty high. I, you know, I think I've shot things up into like the 2000s and I think the photos still look great. I just usually don't have to go higher than that because I'm usually here in my office with my aperture light or I'm outside with a bunch of light. So I usually just have it, you know, I don't know, right now it's at 640, which is fine, but that's usually the thing that I move around first. And then if you know it's already at ISO 100 and it's still too bright, that's usually when I'll crank my shutter up and everything like that. So, you know, just quick little starting point tips, I guess, for what I use my photo settings for. 
And I think that's about it for my main photo settings as well, guys. All right, guys, so those are all the photo and video settings I use for the EOS RP. These are just all the settings that I've learned kind of work best for me and for what I usually am shooting. So obviously everybody's situation and depending on what you're shooting is going to vary. But I kind of just want to put this video together for people who are maybe starting out or maybe are just curious what settings do I use when I'm filming. So if you guys have any more questions about the RP or honestly anything, just camera settings in general, let me know in the comments below and I'll be sure to try to help everybody out that I possibly can. But guys, that is it for today's video. I hope you guys were able to learn something or you just enjoyed watching. And if you stuck around to the end of this video, I really do appreciate you guys. So if you did enjoy today's video, will you drop it a thumbs up? That really helps the channel out. If you're new around here, consider hitting that sub button. I'd really appreciate it. I try to make content, try to help other creators create better looking content. That is a mouthful. My name is Johnny. I will see you guys in the next video very, very soon. Peace.